Welcome to Smart24 TV. Welcome to the oil and the gas program where we talk about Uganda's oil and gas sector. We all know that in 2006, Uganda confirmed commercially viable oil deposits in Uganda. We are talking of over 6 million barrels of oil, of which the journey since then, we've been preparing for Uganda's first oil, which is anticipated to come in a few years' time from now. And we want, as we prepare for that, we want to discuss the different opportunities in the oil and gas sector so that you, the Uganda, know your part. Where is your deal? Where is your cut? How do you stand to benefit from this resource? And to discuss all this with me is the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. This is a government institution that is at the heart of each and every activity in the oil and gas sector. I have two people from the this institution, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. One of them is Susan Muyi, who is the Corporate Affairs Officer at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. You're welcome to the show. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, the second person is Alex Viamkama, who is the, the National Content Officer at the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you so much, Cliff, and greetings to our viewers. Now, Alex and Susan, today we want to talk about the opportunities for different Ugandas in the different sectors, in the oil and gas sector. But perhaps before we go that, that line, we'd like to first talk about the status, uh, the overview of the sector, the current prayers in the sector, who is doing what, because I mean, very many p things are happening in there. So perhaps Susan, take us through this. Who is doing what in, in the oil and gas sector in Uganda currently? Uh, welcome, viewers of uh, Smart24 Television. I'm um, called Susan Muyi, uh, Corporate Affairs Officer with the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. Uh, we have various sectors in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we we'll look at the government side. There's the Petroleum uh, Authority of Uganda, who is the regulator of the sector. And uh, we basically exist to regulate and monitor all petroleum activities in order to bring uh, lasting value in uh, Uganda's economy and to contribute to Uganda being uh, an investment destination. That's um, the main core of uh, our existence. And we do that through uh, regulating various uh, aspects like uh, environment, uh, petroleum data, environment meaning the health, safety, and uh, security aspects of the oil and gas sector. Uh, we also do that uh, by enhancing the participation of Ugandans in the oil and gas sector. These are individuals and enterprises. That is the Petroleum Authority of Uganda in a nutshell. So uh, we have the Uganda National Oil Company, which is taking forward the commercial interests of the government. Then we have the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, which deals with the licensing of new players in the sector. Then on the, we have um, the, the oil and gas sector does not work in isolation from other government entities. So the other partner government agencies, if you may, there's a Uganda Revenue Authority, Uganda National Roads Authority, uh, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Education. And in our discussion, we realize each and every other sector playing specific roles in how Ugandans can benefit. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, that's a, an elaborate overview of the sector. Now, I want to switch to Alex, and we talk about today the current status of the sector. Because, uh, you know, when you understand who is doing what, uh, the current question and the interest for very many Ugandans is what is happening now. Over to you. Thank you, Cliff. Um, Susan has ably uh, given an overview of the sector. I'll just uh, give a small highlight exploration segment where we have uh, two key players that are currently doing exploration and those are Oranto Petroleum Limited as well as AMA. They are doing exploration for Kanyatawa and uh, Angasa uh, fields. Then we have the fields that are moving into development. Those are the big ones. That's the Tibenga, uh, project which is uh, spearheaded by Total, and then we have um, the Kingfisher project which is spearheaded by Sinok. Those are moving into development phase. It's only the that is, is the way to be taken. 
and then we can start off. And a number of activities have been undertaken to get to that uh, stage. And then, of course, after all that is done, there's a segment of commercialization where we have uh, the refinery, which is a 60,000 barrels per day refinery. We have the eco, the East African crude oil pipeline, the longest uh, heated oil pipeline in the world. It's a 1,443 kilometer pipeline, 24 inch, that is going to be transporting oil from Kaba to Tanga in Tanzania. And then we have uh, the other aspect of uh, the new uh, licensing round. Susan has mentioned uh, the Ministry of Energy that is charged with uh, the licensing aspects. So we also have um, uh, a new licensing round that is running up to end of uh, this month, where we expect new players to come on board and start prospecting for, for oil in Uganda. So briefly, those are the segments where we are in the sector. That is where we are, and we're very excited where we've reached, especially with the projects that are going into development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. And now, um, a few things before we head into the next phase of the discussion. We very well know that oil is a finite resource. We very well know that all of us, Ugandans, we cannot get direct jobs in this sector. So now, this brings us to this. How, if I'm not benefiting directly with a job, perhaps I'm working as an engineer or whatever, how do I benefit from this oil resource so that we don't have issues or we don't have cases where a certain section of Ugandans think that this resource is for one group and this resource is for one group, for us we are out. So, Alex, let me ask you this. Are there opportunities for different people, different Ugandans in the oil and gas sector, or it is just for a few people? Thank you, Claire. It is dedicated to what we call national content. Yes. And uh, that speaks to how uh, Ugandans participate and benefit uh, in the sector. In fact, the local content um, policy has a target of 80% participation of Ugandan enterprises and individuals by 2040. So um, it, it, it's a very good conversation that we need to have at this point. And looking at the you know, projects that we've talked about, um, the different segments across the value chain, we anticipate an investment of about uh, 15 to 20 billion US dollars in the next three to five years. So if you look at that amount that we expect to be invested in, in the country, you clearly see that we have an opportunity as Ugandans to participate, to partake of you know, the opportunities that come with that. And indeed, the immense opportunities that this sector presents to the individuals, um, the local enterprises, and then the entire economy in general. Um, if I could just quickly walk through some of the opportunities. We have um, opportunities that relate to the supply of different goods and, and services. And um, we have the, the legal framework that was put in place to ably support uh, Ugandans to participate and benefit from the sector. We have what we call the national content regulations. Those clearly state and support Ugandans to participate. There are aspects of uh, preference for Ugandan goods and services, where if you are in a sector, if you're a company, uh, you're an oil company, even a contractor, even a subcontractor, and you want to procure any particular service, first priority is given to Ugandan companies. Okay? Then in the event that we don't have, there's no company that has the capacity or the quality that you're looking out for, then we go for a joint venture where now a Ugandan company works with probably a foreign company that has the capacity to provide this particular service. And then, of course, through joint venturing, you expect such a Ugandan company to build capacity, to learn a few things here and there. And the next procurement, ideally, they should be able to take it on as a sole entity. If all that fails, then companies can then go out and source a foreign company, but for a particular period that is agreed between the buyer 
and then the PAU. So you see that the legal framework gives that backing. And again, we have what we call the ring-fenced services that are also clearly enshrined in the regulations. There are 16 at the moment. And those are services that are exclusively reserved for Ugandan companies. We don't expect any foreign company to come and play in this space, to come and provide these services. They include civil works, they include um, foods and beverages, they include security, uh, human resource, waste management, and a number of, of, of others that are there. So those, clearly, those are low-hanging fruits for Ugandan companies to you know, pick and then be able to, to supply. We, of course, we expect jobs in the sector. It is not a mass employer. Yes. The sector is not a mass employer. But uh, we expect about 13,000 direct jobs. But if you look at both the indirect and then the induced jobs, then we're talking about 160,000 jobs. That is quite something to look forward to, if you ask me. So these are opportunities for all Ugandans, and majority of these jobs will be technical. So we're not talking about managers seated in the office. Uh, we're talking about technicians. We're talking about um, drivers. We're talking about welders. We're talking about scaffolders. So these are jobs that clearly um, Ugandans can, can, can take on. So those are some of the direct opportunities. And of course, others that we'll be talking about in the course of the discussion that relate to the larger economy, the linkages where you have different uh, economies feeding into the oil and gas um, Th th thank you very much, and uh, you, you've ably uh, sort of like um, laid a very good ground for our discussion because now that we know that the law even ring fences, it establishes all these avenues where Ugandans can come in to to benefit in the oil and gas sector. Now, I want to switch to Susan. Now that we know, even we have a law that you know ensures that there is a way we can benefit, but something which is critical is you cannot benefit from something you don't know. So it's our role, Smart24 TV, Petroleum Authority of Uganda, and all the stakeholders in the oil and gas sector to make Ugandans know that here's where the opportunities are. So let's, for example, talk about education. You know, it's a, a, a very strong sector in the country. Someone out there who is very passionate about education, who is a, a prayer in the education sector, would love to know are there opportunities for people in the education sector, in the oil and gas sector? Uh, yes, the opportunities are there and they are already being uh, uh, reflected, if you may. Um, the government took an approach to have a coordinated skilling effort because you can imagine if so many uh, training institutions mushroom, eh? then the quality of the uh, professional certificates, the professional courses offered might not line up to the standards that are required of the sector. So there is a skills dialogue council uh, w which involves uh, players from the private sector, from the government, from the regulator, PAU, who have come together to discuss eh, a, an appropriate way forward. Um, I think in 2015, uh, the government opened the Uganda Petroleum Institute of Chigumba. Um, as we speak right now, we have uh, an association bringing together uh, trainers, oil and gas trainers association in Uganda, where they are both the private sector <clears throat> and government to take this um, skill forward, to take the effort, the skilling effort forward. So just maybe to give a bit of context, um, uh, studies were done to ascertain the numbers of uh, workers that will be needed and what kind of workers those will be. So it was discovered that 20%, 70% of the workforce required will be technical in the technical area and vocational. So that the approach, government's approach is to make sure that the technicians, because we have good technicians around, people who can do things, eh? like if you go to Katwe, they are there, but then there is need for the international certification, which is quite costly. So the government has accredited, has got some institutions like UPIC accredited to offer that international certification. Then for the benefit of Omuntu uh, Wawansi, like you are saying, one, in order to work as a technician, 
there are certain skill sets that you need. For instance, you need to have to have an idea, say, of welding. So there is a scholarship package, um, and the team, this, the beneficiaries will start when school opens, when the different technical institutions open. So there are about 600 beneficiaries from the Albertine Graben district. Uh, people who have been there for a while, but with a certain skill set. If, say, you have a certificate in mechanical or something like that, so they, they are courses that they applied for, so they will be the perfect fit for the different activities that are coming, because like the pipeline works, say, the construction, um, the construction uh, element of the sector is going to be very intense eh, with various infrastructure that needs to be put up. So, so far about 700 technicians have been trained already with that collaboration of both the government and private sector. So there are people who are benefiting by training for oil and gas. That's the scope that we have right now. Okay. Now, um, when we talk about education, something brings me to this idea of uh, very many people rushing to do oil and gas courses. Even many tertiary institutions, they are starting up oil and gas courses and all that stuff. And we facing a possibility of having too many people looking for jobs in the oil and gas sector when, as he says, uh, direct and indirect jobs, we are talking about 160 jobs only. And we running a risk of having very many people running into, into this sector when actually we don't have very many case, um, jobs there. only in the direct employment. Yes. There's that induced employment, then there are these other issues like you can't be a supplier, you may not necessarily be an employee, but you can be in a joint venture and supply. Or let's talk about, because office supplies and fuel are part of the services that are being ring-fenced for Ugandans. So you might, if you join an association, or get exposed to how you can benefit, that will be an advantage, other than going for a certificate and then being frustrated. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't do that certificate because you compete favorably for those particular jobs. If you, up, like, if you upgrade, you can be able to compete, but it's not like a guarantee that you're going to, be, you're going to benefit from the employment but it's a risk worth taking. But the key message we want to bring out is that the opportunities are broader than direct employment. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much, Thank Ms. You. Susan. Um, yes, Alex. Uh, Thank you. Uh, just to supplement on uh, what my colleague has said, um, she actually mentioned an association for Oil and Gas Trainers Association. So this particular association is where we have uh, different training institutions. Uh, that uh, train oil and gas courses. And the same conversation, the same question that you've raised mm. is, is, is part of the conversation that is usually held during such engagements. Because uh, we hold what we call the skills development dialogue quarter with this association. And the issues that you've raised are the same issues we discussed. We know that indeed it's, it's not a mass employer and, and even then, you are not looking out for um, the, the bulk of the jobs, uh, like she mentioned, you know, technical jobs, uh, vocational jobs. So we are having that conversation with um, the training institutions to make sure that we, we, we don't churn out a lot of um, um, graduates, especially at a level where we have very limited uh, opportunities. But again, the skills that we are emphasizing and talking about here for the oil and gas are transferable skills. The skills uh, that she talked about, the training institutions that she highlighted, for instance, Tupic, the training that they are giving is for skills that are transferable, not only for the oil and gas, but even for the other sectors. So you can acquire those skills, you can acquire that certification, you work in oil and gas, but you still have opportunities in other sectors because they cut across. So, if you go and get that, if you invest your money in acquiring that certification, you will still get the benefits, you will still be employed in the sector at the same time, 
you'll be able to work in any other sector. So in other words, I have a certification yes. of uh, you know, to do welding in the oil and gas sector, but yes. I can transfer the skills and do welding in the ordinary sector where, you know. Exactly, yes. exactly. I can also be. Okay. So now, Alex, let's talk about the sector where the biggest percentage of Ugandans are, are engaged, the agricultural sector. Someone out there might wonder, okay, we are talking about uh, skills, we are talking about going to school, we are talking about certification. The linkages between agriculture sector and oil and gas in Uganda. Thank you, thank you, Cliff. Um, we all know agriculture is, is, is a very significant sector in, in, in the country. And like we earlier mentioned, that oil and gas pretty much touches on every sector of the economy. There's that linkage, there's that effect on, on, on every sector. With uh, agriculture, we are cognizant of that, and uh, it is a sector, I think, at the authority, we have um, extensively engaged to make sure that uh, it, it benefits from um, the development of the sector, of the oil and gas sector. We have had engagements with the ministry. The key players in the sector also, the IOCs, the international oil companies, have also done a lot of work to, to you know, uh, harness the sector. We talked about the 160,000 jobs, that the bulk will be in, in the Alberta and Grab. Yes. But we also know that uh, these activities will bring in a lot of people towards um, that, that, that region in the Grab, close to about a million people in the Grab. They will need to eat, they will need food, so what we, what we are doing at the authority uh, with the key players, the ministry and um, the IOCs, is that we have been preparing farmers in the Albert and Graben to be able to meet the demand that we expect, to be able to provide uh, the, the food requirements that will be needed. We, at the moment, uh, the IOCs, the Joint Venture Partners, are spearheading a project that uh, is called uh, the Agricultural Development Program, together with the Minister of Agriculture and the PAU, where we have um, done a study on the gaps that exist in the Albert and Graben, and then identify the key stakeholder, stakeholders, the key players there in, in the Albert and Graben, and then what we need to do to get them to a level where they can ably supply not just uh, the oil and gas market, but even the regional uh, market. Congo is, is a potential market. It's very close to the Graben. Um, so we have been building capacity. The, the, the agricultural development program has been implemented. And a number of low hanging fruits have also been achieved. There has been training of uh, farmers, horticulture farmers, about 200 farmers, and uh, different groups have been trained. We've had um, exposure visits of um, livestock farmers from the districts of Bolisa, Hoima, Noya, and uh, Chikube to the western part of, of, of the country to appreciate and learn uh, you know, how they can better improve their business. We've also had uh, trainings together with Stanley Bank it has come there and provided trainings, enterprise development trainings, how to run agriculture as a business. Those interventions have, all, have, all, have, all, have also been implemented. And like we mentioned, the infrastructure that is being set up in the region to support the oil and gas industry, we're talking about the roads, the oil roads, uh, that's about 700 kilometers of tarmac. We're talking about the airport that is being built uh, in Kavari. We're talking about the industrial park that is being um, set up. So you can clearly see that for agriculture, those are all opportunities. The roads will, 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 will definitely ease access to market. The airport will also provide a very easy channel to external markets. Um, the industrial park as well, it will definitely be um, an, an off-taker for most of the agricultural products. So we are cognizant of the fact that this sector presents those main opportunities to the, oil and, to the agricultural sector. And we are clearly trying to harness those um, no interventions to make sure that brought to a level where it is good enough. And two, if you're able to supply and meet the standards of the oil and gas sector, because what we're doing with the farmers, 
We're training them to be able to meet the requirements and the standards of the oil and gas sector. So if you are able to meet those standards, then you are globally competitive. You can comfortably export to the oil, rather to the rest of the market. Okay, you can export, and we've had engagements with also the Uganda Export Promotion Board, different um, presentations that have different engagements to highlight aspects of sustainability, aspects of uh, promotion. They've come in and they've highlighted these opportunities. So we know uh, in the event that the oil sector um, you know, goes into a plateau, then these farmers have another market to serve and they can continue earning and exporting their products. Now, the, the oil and gas sector, when we talk about agriculture, we have high, let me use that word, high demands when it comes to quality. Okay, quantity, yes, quality. How have we prepared our farmers in, not only in, in Alberta in region, but also in all these neighboring parts of the country to meet the quality needs of the oil and gas sector when it comes to food supply? Thank you, Cliff. Um, the authority has closely worked with the Uganda National Bureau of Standards. Uh, most of the engagements we've had, uh, we've, we've always invited Uganda National Bureau of Standards to, you know, present, to discuss with participants, to highlight the standards that need to be, uh, need to be met. Even what I referred to the agriculture development program, there's a component of training the farmers, and that is with Uganda National Bureau of, of, of Standards. Um, and if you look at the standards we talk about, really, it, 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 they are not out of this world, okay? This, the word standard usually confuses people. When you talk about standards, someone thinks of ISO, thinks of big, big, big things. But if you look at agriculture and the standards that we talk about are essentially the day-to-day -day things and aspects that people do. How do you harvest your items, your crops? Um, what chemicals do you use to either, as, as you're growing and nurturing your crops, what chemicals do you use? How do you store okay, your products? How do you transport your products? Do you clean them? Because some people you will go uh, to a market and you find you have potatoes, but the way they were picked from the garden is the way they brought them to the market. You know, they have the, the soil and all that. They've not been cleaned. So there are simple things that you even you cliff as you go to the market, the things that you look out for. You want a very clean and um, a, a very clean tomato that has no spots, that is not spoiled. You want uh, potatoes that are very clean or Irish that is very well cleaned. So those are the simple things, uh, the, the, what they call the post-harvest handling methods. How do you transport? How do you harvest? How do you store your product? These are simple things. They are not out of the world. And these are things that Uganda National Bureau of Standards has consistently stressed in our different uh, engagements that we've had. So we've talked to farmers, we've trained them on those uh, standard requirements. The key stakeholders, the IOCs have also come up to highlight their requirements, what they will need, okay, and how they will need them. And that has, all, has also been passed on to the different groups of farmers. And we know, we, we talked about the, the, the quantities, the quantities will be quite a lot, and we've gone ahead to encourage them to form associations, uh, groups, so that they're able to meet um, this particular demand. Now, are these opportunities in agriculture only limited to farmers in the Albertine region? Or farmers in central region, farmers in southwestern region, farmers in Karamoja, farmers in Gulu can also Pick an, idea, pick an idea, pick an interest in tapping into these opportunities. It's counter. -right. I can tell you that at the moment, um, the, the catering companies saw some of the items in Kampala. They come to Kampala. Different farmers, they approach different farmers to supply them. And that is why this message that we consistently have, we don't only take it to, to the Albert and Graben or to those Hoima and uh, districts, but we go to different... Uh, uh, areas to spread this particular message who are in Masaka the other day because we know there's going to be a pipeline going through. Yes. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for every single farmer in the country and not only for the 
our baton for grabbing meals. I want to switch to Susan. In the Arbatan Graben, where our oil is, we happen to have there Uganda's biggest national park, the Maxon Falls National Park. But it's not only Maxon Falls, but very many other tourism attractions and destination areas. We have very many prayers in the tourism sector in Uganda and in the region. What are those opportunities that are there from the oil and gas sector for these people to tap into? and make more money. Um, when you look at the number of people that will come to work in the camps, and because of the high tender activity that will be there, they will not only be working. So it's an opportunity to up the tourist sites, and entice the people who have come to go and look at them, to go and enjoy the beauty of Uganda in those areas and around, and for the country to earn some foreign exchange. Now, that is not just a myth. Um, the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, as you mentioned earlier, has um, identified its industry practice that uh, in order for the sector to have lasting value, uh, you need to look at this, um, the other sectors, how the other sectors, you're not only looking at oil and gas, so the Petroleum Authority of Uganda, together with the Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, are working together on identifying there are already the tourism sites that we are aware of in those areas. Then there are those that have potential to even be improved. So there is a plan on how to upgrade them to a point where they can be marketed uh, before the COVID the, the impact of COVID-19, there was a lot of work going on, including a study okay, and actually being on the ground to find out, to get like an assessment study, to find out and have a way forward. And um, that is now still go ongoing. So once that is uh, resolved, we'll be able to see those opportunities. So that in the event, because even when FID is taken, the final investment decision is taken, uh, the activity in the sector will pick up but there will still be enough time eh, to make sure by the time the first that the people come, those people come, we have some quick gains as we build up to the bigger strategy of how this sector can really benefit, the two sectors can benefit from each other. Your explanation has reminded me of something. There is an argument that uh, we can develop a package and we call it oil and gas tourism package where, for example, you know, a tourist comes, we will be having the longest heated pipeline, we have our oil wells, we have whatever. I don't know, have you discussed with the tourism sector prayers on, you know, taking up oil sector as a tourism package and they sell it to people in the outs outside world so that, you know, it can attract more tourists in there, make more money and widen the understanding, or deepen the understanding of people on Uganda's oil and gas sector. Yeah, definitely, that's a scope that uh, is being looked into. But right now, there are the initial eh, the studies that are being done eh, on first identifying the sites that are already there, the historic sites, and then upgrading them. And then these others can also come in uh, ultimately. As we more or less like come to the end of this discussion, the biggest question now is, how do we benefit from these opportunities that we have highlighted, the Ugandans? And I will start with you, Alex. Someone, a Ugandan, here in Kampara, a Ugandan in Mbara, a Ugandan in Gulo, a Ugandan in Nwaya, a Ugandan in Ntoroko. How do they position themselves to benefit from these opportunities now that they know? Thank you, Cliff. Um, one, uh, take the initiative, first of all, to interest yourself in the sector. Um, get to know the, the regulations uh, that govern the sector, the laws that govern the sector, because they are in, um, th th there's, it, it clearly defines how you can participate and your, the opportunities that are in there and your rights as, as a Ugandan. So interest yourself in, 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 in the sector. Read, attend different engagements that we've always had. We have had so many engagements, and not just the PA, but different stakeholders 
and uh, a lot has been discussed in these engagements that where people can actually pick uh, different aspects. But um, I also want to draw you to our system that is called the National Supply Database, okay. which is uh, a system that uh, registers suppliers that are interested in supplying oil and gas sector. That's, that's, that's key. So for you to be able to supply the sector, you have to be on, on, on that register. And um, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, developed, it was developed by the PAE in 2017, initial as a manual system. Um, but at the moment, it has grown into an um, online system, uh, very easy to use. Uh, it has about 1,700 um, suppliers on that list, both local suppliers and international suppliers. How do one register all these national oil and gas suppliers that are Thank you. It's, it's, like I mentioned, it's an online system. Yes. You go to the Petroleum Authority of Uganda's website. Um, there you, you find a link, um, the national content uh, uh, tab that takes you to the link for the NSD. We call it NSD, short form for National Supplier Database. You create your profile, just like any other registration uh, form. And there you will be required to submit the key documents that we look up, that we request you to, to submit. Uh, you'll be required to attach your certificate of incorporation or registration. You will be required to get um, a tax clearance certificate from URA. Uh, that's for Ugandan um, <coughs> company. For foreign companies, you get the clearance certificate and proof of registration from uh, your respective uh, issuing bodies. Uh, we definitely want um, a letter from your bankers. Um, then we will also need uh, um, details on your shareholding as, as, as you register. That's for companies. For individuals, we request you to submit. Um, you have to have your team number, you have to have uh, your, your, your national identification. Uh, as well. You can also upload um, the CV and a letter of good conduct uh, or what we call or what a police letter. Just talk about who you are, make sure that you're, you're an upright um, citizen. So th th those are the requirements you submit and then the authority does verification. For foreign companies, we work closely with the um, Minister of Foreign Affairs to do the vetting of the foreign companies. For local companies, we work with um, NSSF, um, we work with URA, we work with URSB, because you will be required uh, to submit also the NSSF uh, clearance certificate. So we work with those companies to verify the authenticity of the documents that you've submitted. And then when you pass the test, you are qualified, and then you can appear in the register for three years. So after the three years have elapsed, uh, then you have an opportunity to apply again. It seems uh, like the uh, qualities are very many. This document, this document, this document. Um, isn't it a concern? It is not a concern. The oil and gas industry is uh, an <coughs> industry. It, it's, it's standard worldwide. The standards are, world, uh, are, are uniform worldwide, and you don't want to have a company that is not well structured, that is not registered, that is even non-existent to be playing in this sector. So even these companies that are involved in the sector, okay, when they go and pick from the national supplier database, they also subject the same companies to another set of uh, verification to meet their requirements. <coughs> what we are the authority is a preliminary check to make sure that this company exists. It has um, the legal capacity to provide uh, this particular service. So, so these requirements, requirements are, are really a necessary benchmark. Exactly. If you look at public procurement also, <laughs> these are the same documents that they will require. So 
but they are not very difficult uh, to, to, to obtain. They are very, very easy to get. If you don't qualify for those, then you get exemptions from the same institutions. It's, it's very fine. So that is what you present uh, for, for uh, at the time of applying. Okay. So, so from what I got from your discussion is you can register as an individual or as a corporate body or as a company. Correct. Now, do I, if I don't register, can I get a contract, for example, to supply goods and services in the oil and gas sector in Uganda? No, you can't. Um, the law and the regulations require that for every supplier to be able to provide goods and services in the oil and gas sector, you must be registered in the national sector. So there is no way out, there is no middle ground, you must register for that, to that on the database for it to supply goods and services. Yeah, okay. that you, you register on okay. the NSP, uh, to be able to provide uh, services. And a lot, I talked about the 1,700 companies, about 70% of them are Ugandan companies. So they are, they, 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 they are there. So we encourage uh, companies to apply. Those that probably didn't know about the NSP, we encourage them to um, make it a point to visit our website and apply, uh, submit those documents so that you are able to have that opportunity to be concerned for, for supply of different goods and services in, in the sector. But again, what we also need to emphasize is that um, when you get onto the register, it's not like, automatic that you get you know, a contract because you are again subjected to another verification by the buying company if you meet um, they are criteria in terms of um, the proposals, the cost that you're giving, then um, you're then given an opportunity. So it's not a must that you, you, you will get um, a contract by registering with the NSD. But it gives an opportunity to be visible, to be identified, and for you to participate in the sector. And even then, it also gives you an opportunity to, to joint venture. I mentioned earlier on the aspect of joint venture where you have a company, where you have Ugandans unable to supply particular goods and services, and then you're going for an option of JVs or working for a joint venture. So if you're an NSD, there are companies out there who are also on the NSD, foreign companies, looking for opportunities to joint venture uh, with Ugandan companies. So if you're there, then you can easily be identified uh, for a joint venture and an opportunity to provide the goods and services and then grow your capacity. This has happened as we witnessed uh, the joint ventures um, being achieved through the NSD. Thank you, Alex. I want to cross over to Susan. Susan, Alex talks about the National Oil and Gas Supplier Database, but there is also the Talent Register. Now, why would someone be interested, or why should someone register on the Talent Register? And what's the difference between the Talent Register and the Supplier's Database? It's uh, the National Oil and Gas Talent Register. Um, it's different because this one is looking at individuals, individuals probably like you and myself, who have the skills, um, have the potential to be absorbed into the sector. The purpose of that register is to know, like, how many, for the government to know, like, how many people have these kind of qualifications because whatever work that is done in the sector by the respective government institutions has a legal basis. So there, are there is a national content legislation and then there is uh, the requirement to have uh, participation of Ugandan enterprises and individuals as well. So the register will help, helps government have um, an insight into how much talent is there so that when uh, one of the international companies wants to hire somebody and they say they are bringing an expatriate, there will be reason to say but from this database we are seeing we have quite a number of people who can manage your accounts. Why do we need an expatriate? But that can't happen when those people are not in a central database. So the benefit for the individual is visibility as well, and also um, that interaction. Eh? I would look at it as a, a LinkedIn profile because you also register, create a profile, and then you're able to also see because it's uh, it has two sides. 
the employees and the employer side, so employers in the sector also register. So they post jobs there. So you can be able to look at a job and compete favorably. It's not uh, automatic that you get the job, but it increases your visibility. So if they are looking for a specific skill and you're registered there, you stand a better chance than someone that is not registered. So yeah, that's basically it. So while the national supplier database looks at the enterprises, like the business side of things, here you're looking at uh, individuals. And their talents. So the national suppliers database, you register via the Petroleum Authority of Uganda website. Is it the same registration procedure with the talent register? It's the same. The requirements are different though. Um, you need certified documents. You need to upload them on the system. As you get the prompts, you upload the certified academic certificates. Uh, they have to be certified. So you update, then create an account. So we are working on improving the system where you can get notifications on when jobs uh, in your area are uh, posted, also the progress of your application, and also on our side to quicken the, uh, the authentication process. We are partnering with uh, the national um, NIRA, we are partnering with NIRA and then uh, NITA U as well to be able to communicate easily to merge those government systems for ease of verification. Because you don't want a scenario where someone is hired and they are a ghost employee, so to speak. They don't have the, they've uploaded the certified documents, but they are not, like they are not the person. Then that would not reflect well on how we are managing the different issues. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I want us uh, to wrap up this discussion. I will uh, ask Alex for your final views, your final comments on uh, preparedness and, and the opportunities in oil and gas sector as we look forward to our next discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Um, I think my parting shots would be to, to encourage Ugandans uh, both individuals and um, enterprises to actively look forward to participating in the sector. The government has done a great job to put into a solid um, legal framework uh, that supports national participation. And um, it is now an opportunity for us to get the skills, to get ready, to get the competencies and expertise and the capacity to be able to provide um, different services. The 15 to 20 billion US dollars that we talked about, I think it's a very good opportunity. And like I, like I mentioned, the target for national participation uh, that is uh, highlighted by the local content policy is 80% by 2040. So I encourage all Ugandans to embrace uh, the opportunities that the sector brings, register on the national supply database for those that haven't um, registered, Please visit our, our website, www.pau.go.ug, to be able to register on the National Supplier Database and be able to participate. Thank you so much. Yes, parting shots, Suzanne. Uh, my parting shot would be, uh, in terms of preparation, is to um, reveal, probably we should have mentioned it in the, at the beginning, that we've had participation of Ugandan talent and uh, businesses during the exploration stage. So as we talk about the, the opportunities, uh, they've already, the Ugandan businesses and talent have been tried in the sector already. For instance, we've not had to get expatriates to discuss the negotiations that are ongoing. And then we've also had, um, we, we've had uh, Ugandan companies doing the environment and social impact assessment for, the, for most of the projects. And we've also had them involved during the exploration stage in civil works, um, camp management. So there is uh, hope for the sector and there is hope for all of us to, for, for Ugandans to participate. And my parting shots are, uh, be available for the opportunities, seek out the opportunities, 
uh, with an unbiased mind and see where you can fit and position yourself. Take up the registration seriously uh, in time and give it due diligence. Thank you. Thank you, Susan Muyiyu. Thank you, Alex Biamukama from the Petroleum Authority of Uganda. We've been talking about the different oil and gas sector opportunities which are out there. It is clearly evident that all of us, we can tap into all these opportunities. All you have to do is to prepare. Part of the preparations involves you picking an interest in these opportunities, seek information about these opportunities. Smart24 TV is here. We are doing our role to educate you, to bring all this information to you register or the National Oil and Gas Supplies Database on the Talent Register so that together we can benefit from this resource and we build our country together. Cliff Avenue is my name and thank you for watching Smart24 TV.